So uh, yes, this is the topic for today, technical agile coaching with the Sandman method. And um, I wanted to start by uh, having showing you some survey outcomes from some of the people who I've coached. Uh, this is a survey I sent out and these are some of the questions they answered. And they said that the outcomes after the coaching included um, improved teamwork and collaboration, more likely to write unit tests, more likely to work in small increments, com committing code more often, more likely to improve design and refactor safely, more likely to use tests to drive de development and design readable, maintainable test cases. So this, this is a very unscientific small survey, but I just wanted to point out the Salman method works better than anything else I've done. And I'm gonna tell you about it today. And I'm also wondering if this is a possible career choice for some of the people who are here today in this virtual room. And um, perhaps this might be a choice for you. So I'll say more about that uh, during the talk. But first, I actually wanted to start with a, a bit of a survey of all the people who are here. And I've got this um, Mentimeter thing. Uh, the track chair should have shared a, a link to it in the chat. Otherwise, you can go to menti.com and put the code in. And this is a word cloud. So you want you to write your answers to this question and you can put as many words as you like. But if you put the same word as somebody else, then that word gets bigger in the word cloud. So let's see if we as a conference can, uh, you know, establish any words here. Is there any words here that are going to get really big because lots of people have written them? So uh, see, this is an exercise in, uh, there's a feedback loop here. Read what other people have put and try and uh, join in. Oh, this is great. I can see that this, is, this word cloud is starting to, to form. Yeah, so early leaders here about teamwork and communication coming up a lot. Quality, focus. Yeah, tests and tools are in there as well. I don't know how many people are here, but there's a lot of words appearing here. But uh, the words that lots of people are writing are learning, teamwork and communication. Coffee's in there too, that's good. So I'm gonna leave that, that buzzing away in the background a bit. Um, because I want to show you, I asked this question on Twitter um, a week or so ago, and then I, I looked at all the many, many answers I got, and I, I noted them down on little post-it notes, and then I put them on this virtual board and moved them around and, and tried to see if any themes came out. And um, I found these eight themes that I thought were coming up a lot in the tweets, and, and I could arrange the post-its like this. And um, some of them are very general that would be probably true for any professional, uh, the human needs, the, the need for, for teamwork and, and learning and professional development. These are clearly important to developers and many others. But I think there are some here which are very specific for software developers, which are around this achieving a flow state, making progress, having a good code and a good coding environment, um, shared coding rules and architecture, things like that. So I think there's a lot that we have in common as software developers, and there's a lot that um, is actually a bit different with our professional lives than others. So I'm just going back to this word cloud, see if it's if it's um, settled. It has a bit, yes. So still, there's lots of these human needs and these teamwork things coming up here. But also we've got tools and tests and ethics um, and quiet have, have all come up in the, the top kind of thing. So I think you're, you're largely agreeing with the people I, I found on Twitter. Um, so I think this is interesting and it, it matches uh, my experience, of course. I wanted to tell you a story. Um, this happened uh, about 20 years ago now. I joined a team and we decided to do extreme programming. So we all read the book and and we all started like, all right, this looks great. We're going to write some tests. And we wrote tests and we had we had really good quality code. And, and we did loads of pair programming. Um, and we got this great sense of camaraderie in the team. Um, and we had somebody who was acting as the um, the on-site customer. And, and we were really making good progress. And, and I had such a good time in that team. 
And the reasons for it were not just that the, the, the teamwork was good, but it was also the code was good and the tests were good. Unfortunately, though, we didn't find enough customers to buy the product and the, the, the project was canned and I was moved to another team, which was much more traditionally organised. We all worked individually. The code had loads of bugs in. There was this team spirit just wasn't there. And that mentoring and pairing that I was so valuing was just not there. And I was pretty miserable, actually, having seen what it could be like. And if you look at the rest of my career since then, it's largely been a case of trying to recreate that XP team that I had so much fun on. Um, and I, I wanted to say again, it's it wasn't great just because of the people. I mean, the people were great. It was great also because of the technical practices we adopted. So I wanted to do another little Mentimeter survey now about technical practices, whether you, you agree with me. So... Um, I've got another question now. If you go back to Mentimeter, it should ask you this instead. Do you see a need for any of these technical practices in your team or organisation? So, hoping some people will take a minute to answer six questions. So. Here we are, starting to get some answers. Yeah, lots of people are, are seeing the need for these things. I'm gonna read them out actually for anyone who's watching the video and has, has got the video switched off. So the first technical practice here is adding automated tests to existing code. Then we've got reducing technical debt safely via refactoring. We've got writing automated tests for new code and features. We've got dividing a large feature into small deliveries. Integrating all your work at least daily onto the main or master or trunk branch. And then anyone can get ill suddenly and the team will still be able to complete anything that's half finished they were working on. And these are all um, technical practices which I see as, as part of, of what makes a good effective team. And I think what I'm seeing from this survey is lots of people who are here agree with me. The ones that are getting the most votes is this um, actually reducing technical debt safely via refactoring. Um, so that's interesting. That's got like nearly, oh, over twice as many votes as the integrating all your work at least daily. So clearly there's a lot of people who are concerned about that particular problem with technical debt. So that's cool. Um, I'm not alone. <laughs> Um, I wanted to point out that uh, this very kind of non-scientific survey uh, backs up actually what is in this research that I wanted to highlight. This book came out a couple of years ago and uh, it's based on many years of research. And actually since the book came out, more, more research has come out as well. The authors are Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble and Jean Kim, who are all very well respected people in the, particularly in the DevOps uh, movement. Nicole Forsgren has a PhD in statistics. So I think as research goes, it's it's not just random questions, you know, this is really well thought through statistically. And I wanted to highlight some of the things that they've found in this research. And uh, they've identified behaviours that lead to, to high performance as so a software development organisation, what kind of behaviours are, are really um, driving that success. And uh, I've put a selection of them on this slide, but actually I'm not going to have time to go through them all. I'm just going to say a little more about the empowered teams without handovers, because my experience is that a great team is great, both to work on and for results. And then the continuous delivery part of this, which is where a lot of technical practices come in. So I'm sure it hasn't escaped your notice that software today is built by teams. And a good team is one where there is uh, psychological safety. That's what the, the research shows. It's uh, cross-functional, as, as the whole agile movement has been saying for years. And it's empowered. And this research actually has quite a, uh, a detailed definition of what they mean by, um, by empowered. I wanted to pick up on that. Because um, they, they say that basically empowered teams are ones that can make large-scale design changes 
Without detailed coordination outside of the team, they can deploy on demand and they can do their own testing. So that's a lot more than that uh, they're just kind of cross-functional. They're also taking a lot of responsibility for the software they build. And you can't achieve this, I don't think, just by focusing on the human aspects and the process in the organization. There needs to be a technical aspect. There needs to be architecture that supports this and technical ways of working that support this. And that's where we kind of come to this continuous delivery piece, which is in the Accelerate research, comes up as being important for success. And for us as software developers, so this is, this is one of the pictures uh, from the research that I've kind of summarized. There's a lot more detail in the actual reports if you read them. But continuous delivery in the middle here, that's the thing that uh, has shown to be so um, influential in causing less burnout, less deployment pain, and helping the organization to reach their goals. So for us as software developers, this is really encouraging. If, if we're doing these technical practices that enable us to say we're doing continuous delivery, we can experience um, less burnout and less deployment pain. Um, and that's, that seems to me like uh, it's worthwhile to look in more. What are the technical practices that this research has highlighted? And I'm just going to lift the lid there on that great big box and reveal some of the practices that they've um, picked up on and found to be statistically significant, driving the adoption of continuous delivery. And some things you probably expect, they're like automated deployment. And that means, you know, if you're going to continuously deliver, you can push a button and code goes into production. That kind of seems uh, like it would definitely influence your ability to do that. But some of these others, the, the, the link might be a bit less clear to you. And I wanted to um, talk much more about these three that I'm just highlighting here, um, because they are practices that, in my experience, are really important for achieving a team that works really well and is successful. So I wanted to talk first about test-driven development, actually. And this is a part of, in the Accelerate re research, they refer to it, I think, as continuous testing, and TDD is a part of, of that. And um, there's more to it, of course. Um, but TDD is a practice that I can explain to you in a few minutes. You uh, begin when you're working on a new feature or a new piece of software. You begin by writing a test that fails. It's red to show that you haven't implemented that feature yet. The code doesn't work yet. But you've got a test that demonstrates that. And then you go and write some code uh, and you make that test pass. And you might take horrendous shortcuts at this point to try and get that test to pass. But that's given you the feedback that it is in some way possible to write software to make this test pass. And then you can go and refactor and improve the design. And so long as the tests stay green, you know that it still works. And then, of course, when you're happy with the design, you can go and write another test and repeat this cycle. So lots of people um, probably have explained this to you, and you may have already seen a demo of this before, but I've, uh, I thought I would just show you, um, this is a very short demonstration of doing TDD on the Leap Years Carter. And this is Cyber Dojo, which uh, you may have seen, and there'll be a link to that in the chat as well. And this is a description of the Leap Years Carter. It says, write a function that returns true or false depending on whether the input integer is a leap year or not. And it goes through the rules. It's defined as one that's divisible by four, not divisible by 100, unless it is divisible by 400. And then it gives examples. And this is great. So I'm just going to copy those examples because those examples are going to turn into my test cases. So that's um, a really useful feature of this particular cart that comes with examples. So this is um, CyberDojo. I'm just showing you how it works. I'm just running this test. Um, I've got a test here that does nothing. It just asserts false is equal to true. And unsurprisingly, it fails. So that's just to prove that I've got a working compiler and test runner. And then, of course, I can go and fix this test to check that I can get it to go green. So if I make that true, then the test should pass. Great. So I've got a working coding environment. And now I can start working on my actual problem that I want to solve. So I'm just going to paste in those 
um, examples that I took from the description earlier. And um, that's going to influence my, my test cases. So I can uh, turn this first example here into a test case. Um, it's, it's not a leap year. And here I need to call my, my new leap year function. And uh, at this point, this function doesn't exist. I've just decided that it's going to be called is leap, and I've just pretended that it exists. So now when I run the tests, they fail. And it says, oh, I've got a compiler error. Yes, that's exactly what I expected. Great, I've got the feedback. I'm on track. I'm do things are happening the way I expected. So then, of course, I need to go and write some production code. Uh, so I need a file for that. Let's just make sure I name it correctly. So I import it and stuff. And then let's write this is leap function. And just to start with, I'm just going to have it return true because I want to see my test fail the first time I run it. Because this is TDD. There, it's gone red. And that's the first step in test-driven development. I can, I've proved to myself that I've got a test that I can execute and I can see it fail. Um, but I don't want to stay in a red state for too long. So just as quickly as I can, I'm going to make it pass. And there I took a complete shortcut and just had it return the exact value my test was expecting. So that's got me to green, and now I can I can do stuff. Now I can I can refactor, or I can add another test. And at this point, I think yeah, let's just add another test here. So I'm going to write a test here for a typical leap year, and the example that I've got here is is 1996. And of course, my test my new test fails. Great. So now I'm going to uh, have to go and actually write some code that does something. And because I, I understand this problem well enough to jump straight to a kind of a somewhat general solution for most leap years, I'm just going to put that in, just use the modulo. And uh, that is enough code to get both those tests passing. So that's good. So now I've got a third test. I need to be able to handle atypical common years. 1900 is an atypical common year. So my code doesn't handle this, the test fails. So now I can go and check, what was it, the rule for this one? Oh yes, it was divisible by 100. That's the reason this one isn't a leap year. So I need, I can just fix this quite quickly by putting in another if statement, checking if it's divisible by 100. Then my test passes. Great, so I'm nearly there. I've just got one more example to turn into a test. Um, so let's do the year 2000. I don't know if you remember, but this was a leap year even though it's divisible by 100. And that's the other rule. It's the thing about 400. So I'm just going to put in the code for that as well to make this test pass as well. Great. So now I've got four passing tests and I've got this function and I can uh, now go away and refactor it some more if I feel like it. Um, but otherwise, uh, I've just demonstrated some test-driven development. Oh, you're still going on these questions. That's good. Um, so uh, that was a demonstration of TDD. And in that demo, the cycle time was minutes or even seconds. It doesn't always go quite that smoothly or quickly. And uh, But I want to, what I can do in a, a keynote is for five minutes, I can show you what TDD looks like kind of in miniature. When you're doing it for real, the, the cycle might be a little longer might write a little more code in between test runs, but the basic principle is, is um, the same. You're looking for feedback as often as you can. Am I on track? Is the code doing what I expect? Am I, are my tests failing with the messages I expect? Um, do I have a stable situation here where I feel confident that everything is going well? This is all about feedback loops. Agile development is all about feedback loops. And TDD is like the innermost feedback loop. But you could I've got this picture here of other feedback loops you might be interested in as a developer. Um, like the integration loop, where you integrate your work with the other people in your team. And the test there is, you know, does it compile and the unit test still run? Um, then there's other feedback loops, which, uh, you know, they get slower as you go out. You might be deploying a test environment or beta users. Um, you might be then making a release and the, the test there is whether the customer likes it. Can they use your software? And in some, some way, how agile you are depends on how quickly you can go around these loops. This is the, uh, 
TDD is like the heart of agility, but it's not the only piece of it. And the Accelerate research, actually, um, the kind of measures they're using to measure how good you are at development, are, at some one level, they're measuring the size of these loops. And the other measures are all about how good quality you're managing um, to put out, whether you're responding well to your feedback and getting good stuff out. So going back to this picture here, um, I've talked a lot now about test-driven development as the innermost loop of the, um, the feedback cycles that you have. Let's talk more now about continuous integration and trunk-based development, because that's, that's basically the next um, feedback loop. So continuous integration is defined basically as um, the first steps in your delivery pipeline should run green frequently. So I've got a picture here of a deployment pipeline, uh, which starts with a developer committing some new code, some new feature that they want to get out into production. The first step in the automated pipeline is to take that code, build it, run the unit tests, and build it some more, maybe, and turn it into some kind of deployable component, a package that could potentially be deployed into production. Then the rest of the pipeline is running further checks on that package to see whether it, we, we still think it's a good idea to put it into production. So we might do system tests and load tests and manual acceptance tests or whatever before we actually deploy that thing. But this first part of the pipeline here, that's the part that we refer to as continuous integration and that we can say we're doing it if we get green to that point at least daily. Um, so that's, that's what continuous integration means. Then we've got trunk-based development, also highlighted in the Accelerate research. And that basically means that if you look at um, where the code is, it's all the developers are um, putting their code onto the master or the trunk or the main branch um, frequently. That is where the, the, it's happening. Um, we might take out release branches uh, from, from the trunk, but developers are not working in those branches. They're not adding code to those branches. And as the other thing about trunk-based development, again, there's this time aspect that these, if you have any feature branches, they're very short-lived, ephemeral. They live maybe for a day. So if you're doing a development process that involves pull requests, as a gate before your code gets to trunk or master or main. If your pull requests are hanging around for days at the time before they get merged, you're not doing trunk-driven driven, trunk-based development. So this is actually a bit of a, a controversial practice in a lot of places, because it's saying you can have feature branches, but they have to be really, really short-lived. So if you combine these two things, um, these three things, continuous integration, trunk-based development, and test-driven development, you basically come up with a situation where everyone in the team has almost the same code on their machines, and they have a shared view of the status. They, they are, any differences between my machine and your machine is just work that you've done in the last few hours. And we all have the same test suite that we're running, and if it's, if it's red, then that's, we all care about that. So this is what, what happens. This is uh, the kind of, socio-technical teamwork um, that is, is made possible by a combination of, of social practices and technical practices. That's what I was talking about. The XP team there, it wasn't just that we, we liked each other and we had great teamwork. We were doing technical practices too. So I'm a bit curious about the people here, whether you already see yourselves as working this way. So uh, could you humour me? and come in and, and answer these questions on Mentimeter. So I'm asking, are you doing test-driven development? Are you doing continuous integration? Are you doing trunk-based development? And do you work well as a team? Great, a few people starting to answer this. Well, that's interesting. The early results here is that there are less people doing test driven development and more people doing continuous integration and nearly as many doing trunk based development. Um, and lots of people are working well as a team. 
Right, right. So this is interesting. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of people are doing trunk-based development. That's that's really encouraging because that is one of the, the really important practices that are highlighted here. Cool. So I think the answer is settling down now. Less TDD. Um, good teamwork though. So that's that's kind of encouraging. Um, because for me, this is it's very different. If you get all of these practices up and running, it's um, it's a different way of building software. And I like to make this analogy with skiing. So we've got here the uh, the person on the left with the legs wide apart, uh, the skis in a V. That's a snowplow technique. She's proceeding safely and carefully at a slow speed down at a gentle slope. The other skier is doing parallel turns. He's going much faster and he's got the skis next to each other. It's a completely different style and technique for skiing. And they are good in different situations. Just like in my experience, doing TDD and continuous integration trunk-based development is a very different way of building software than, than the more traditional debug later approach. And in my experience, if you've ever tried skiing, learning, if you've learned snowplow, then trying to go and learn parallel turns, it's there's a it's difficult. It's a completely different way of doing things. And um, you, the thing with TDD, it's it's a, uh, it's a totally different balance. It's a different way of doing things, and and it's not straightforward to transition. So that is kind of what I, I'm whole oh, big lead up now to talking about um, how you start changing the way you work. And I want to. I've got another um, another Mentimeter server to find out about what kind of learning activities you're doing. Because in my experience, this doesn't just happen by itself. People need encouragement and teaching and, and stuff. So that's what I'm interested in know what you're already doing. Um, do you have a book club? Do you go on instructor-led training courses? Do you do online on-demand training videos? Do you do pair programming? Do you do brand bag lunch and learns? Do you practice on code carters? Do you do hackathons? Do you have a community of practice? Do you do code reviews? And I'm starting to see some results coming in here. Lots of people are doing code reviews and lots of people are doing on-demand training videos. Um, and these are all, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone. From, I, want, I want everyone to be doing all of this stuff. This is all great stuff. Um, so I'm just interested to see what your company and your situation has chosen. And uh, yeah. Yeah, really, a lot of a lot of code reviews. That's great. Um, cool. That I've, of course, I've got a, a follow up question. I'm gonna I'm gonna move to the follow up question now. Okay. So, what of those? It's the same list of activities. Which of these have you successfully used to learn test driven development? And I've got the same list, except I've added other. <laughs> And I haven't actually learned TDD. So uh, we'll see how many people have found success in some of these other things. Um, yes, yeah, so the early results coming in here, of course, there's a lot of people saying that they haven't really learned TDD. But of those who have, um, I'm seeing uh, early success for frequent pair programming. I'm seeing success for online on-demand training videos, code reviews, and instructor-led training courses. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so again, if you're finding success with these things, that is great. Carry on doing that. Um, but I have to say, in my experience, TDD is difficult to learn, and a lot of these methods only give kind of partial or um, infrequent success. And that is one of the reasons I wrote my first book about the coding dojo, coding dojos, uh, which was a, a way I'd found to get people actually to start doing TDD. And a coding dojo is a, a place where you go to learn with other programmers. So um, it, you get together a bunch of people, um, two or three hours maybe, do it with your team, do it in evenings with a user group. 
get together, write some code in pairs on a code carter, discuss what you learn. And this, I found, was a good way to introduce uh, this TDD as a practice to people. And uh, this book, I wrote it about 10 years ago now, and based on my experiences in the, the five years before that. Uh, so this is, this is a reasonably good thing to do. Then, but the thing is, I found that it, it didn't, wasn't as successful as I'd hoped. Like many of those things that were on the Mentimeter survey, you get partial success, but it didn't really stick in a lot of situations. Um, and I was kind of a bit, yeah, I'd done much less coding dojos uh, when I got invited by Llewellyn Falco to pair coach with him. Now, Llewellyn Falco is a technical agile coach uh, from the US, and uh, he invited me to join him in the US with, at his client, where he was coaching some teams. And uh, he wanted to, uh, you know, I think largely because of my book on coding dojos, he wanted me to come and, and uh, do some of that stuff with his teams. And and he could learn from me and I could learn from him. This was a, a transformation experience in my career, just like that XP team was in the first place. I saw what he was doing with these teams and it was it was actually working. I could see that people were actually, in some of the teams he was coaching, people were actually using TDD. And I hadn't really seen that happen from the coaching I'd been doing. So that led me to come back to Sweden and start to try and apply some of the same techniques that he was using and develop them further in my, my situation. And ultimately that's what led me to write this book that I just published. And um, the book is about this coaching method for working with software development teams to improve the way we write software. And I named it Saman because it's a Swedish word that means together. And I thought that characterised this, this method and I wanted there to be a term you could actually write into a search engine and find out more information, that it would be a concrete thing that you could find out more about. So Saman coaching is about all the things that we've already been talking about. It's about better unit tests, TDD, it's about continuous integration, refactoring, iterative and incremental design, rescuing legacy code when you've got too much technical debt and leveling up the whole team together. There are two main parts to the Saman method. The first part is learning hours, which I'm gonna say a lot more about in just a moment. And the second part is ensemble working, which is another name for mob programming. And I'm also gonna say a lot more about that soon. So learning hours, these are like, basically it's a short, frequent coding dojo. Um, and as a coach or a teacher, I'm planning these and structuring them as kind of lessons. And this is my website um, where I've got lots of lesson plans, basically, for these learning hours. Um, I've taken a huge amount of inspiration from Sharon Bowman and her book Training from the Back of the Room and her other books. Um, she's great about explaining how to make teaching and learning engaging, hands-on, experiential, Going back to the skiing analogy, it's, it should be like a skiing lesson. You've got your mates together, you're having a bit of messing around, um, you've got somebody helping you and instructing you, but actually you're trying out a lot for yourself and it's fun and you learn stuff. So I'm just going to talk more about this. Um, learning hours have a 4C structure and the first C is the connect, where we try and connect with what you already know about the topic. So if you remember, I just did a Mentimeter survey asking you about what you were already tried for learning test-driven development. That was my way to connect with what you already know about that topic. The next C is concept. That's where I somebody basically has to try and get you to learn something new, find out a new concept that you didn't know before. And one way is to stand here and present using slides and tell you what it is that you should learn, uh, which is what I've just been doing. But if you're really good at this 4C learning techniques, you'll have that concept part embedded in some kind of exercise where people can find out that information for themselves. People learn much better if they, it's kind of learner driven and they are pulling that information out of different sources and integrating it with what they already know. The next C is concrete. That's where you really want to get the people to use what they're learning about. 
actually apply this technique. So if I was going to use the 4C model now, I would get you to all go away and design some training that uses this model. That's a little tricky to do in a keynote. So I thought I would just show you what I made earlier, which isn't at all as effective, but it might give you some ideas. Um, so this is a learning hour outline of one that I've designed about, about refactoring. It's, there's a link to it in the chat, I hope. Um, and the first connect activity is I've got some warm up questions where I ask people to think about what do they already know about refactoring? What do we as a group think about these things? Can we have a little discussion about that? And then the concept, very quickly, I just say my opinion about when you should refactor. Uh, and then we do an exercise in refactoring um, in, in pairs, or we might actually, we might do it in an ensemble. Um, and then just at the end, uh, we won't go away in part without having a quick review. Do we have any different thoughts now on what we thought from the start? Has anything changed? Do we have some conclusions? Because that's the fourth C, the conclusions. Um, that's where uh, you have to try and work out what it is you learnt, put it in your own words, and consolidate it so you remember it. And celebrate that you learnt something new. So, please, do go and write something in the chat, summarising what you've just learned about the 4C model um, and training from the back of the room. I'll get some water. So maybe that was a bit of a surprise. People are, oh, right, right, some people have written some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learning by doing. Connect discussions, yes. Oh, this is great. It's giving me feedback that you've actually been listening. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to um, just do carry on writing stuff. Um, I'm going to talk now more about the other part of the Saman method, which is the ensemble working. Now, I, I showed you this about the, um, you know, learning a new way of skiing, and that's what the learning hours are all about. But there's a, there's a, there's a part of this which um, you need at some point to move beyond the beginner slopes. You need to move beyond being able to do TDD in a code carter where everything is really straightforward and beautiful. Oh, that looks like such a nice slope to go down. Um, but actually, in real life, the slope might look like this. Your, your, uh, your production code probably is a little more bumpy and there might be a few more people in the way. Uh, and you might need to... Uh, be a little better at doing parallel turns before you would attempt it there. Or you might need someone to help you to apply your parallel turns technique in this situation. And that's where we come to the ensemble working. So ensemble working is also called mob programming. Um, but this is where we, we get the whole team together and we're going to write code together. Uh, we're going to work on a realistic task, something that's typical for this team, something from the backlog, um, some coding um, feature, some refactoring task that's something this team would have to work on in normal life. And we're going to focus on trying to learn to apply the techniques to this problem with the coach rather than make progress and complete the task. So you're going to try and slow down in order to speed up later. So, as I mentioned, this technique is also called mob programming, and Woody Zool is the, the discoverer or promote, proponent of this technique. And he described it like this. We've got all the brilliant people working at the, on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, on the same computer. And he chose to call it mob programming, I, and he wrote this book uh, with Kevin Meadows. I highly recommend it. 
I decided that I didn't like to call it mob programming because that sounds really negative. I much prefer to talk about ensemble working because that sounds, for me, much more like what it's like. It's about like a group of musicians playing off uh, one another, improvising and collaborating and making beautiful music, you know? So uh, this is why I've, I've adopted this word, ensemble. But it's the same thing. So there are roles to make this work. If you've done pair programming, it's kind of similar, but if you add more people to pair programming, you find that you need a little more structure. And uh, I choose to call the roles uh, the typist, person with a keyboard, and navigator, the person who is speaking and explaining what to do, and you rotate often. And this is where I have another demo. This is um, an ensemble working session that it's five minutes, and I'm just gonna play this video of me and my colleagues doing ensemble working. Yes. So we're gonna do some ensemble working with the three of us, and we're going to tackle the, the Mars Rover Carter, which is described on this webpage. Um, if you go to uh, sandlandcoaching.org, you should be able to find Mars Rover uh, description. And uh, there's some bump about what it is and then how it works. And basically, we've this is the part that is going to be the first, well, the, the acceptance test, um, or like the, you know, it shows you the whole problem. So I'm just going to go through this. It says that, you know, this line means that there's a, a plateau that's five by five. Um, this line means that you've got a rover that starts out at the position coordinates one, two, facing north. Um, this is the list of commands that get sent to that rover. Uh, left, move, left, move, and there should be right as well if, if it was going to move right. But L and M are left and move. And then that's the end position that we expect. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. That's the other rover. There are two rovers. So 33E three, three e is the position of the other rover. And that's its instructions. And then we expect to get this output that says, right, okay, the first rover then ends up at this position and the second rover ends up at this other position. So that's the uh, the problem. We, we need to write a code that will take this kind of input and produce this kind of output. So we're going to work in an ensemble with the three of us. Okay. So, uh, Emily, you're the typist first, and uh, Samuel, you're the navigator, and I'm next. Can you please go to the um, web page again? I want to copy the example uh, input and output respectively, yeah. Um, and I want them to be in two strings, one called input and one called output. Yeah, could you break it then at the, yes? Um, and I think we can remove the line 18 as well. So now I want you to create a very simple test case. Yes, thank you. Uh, and we see that, that, can we just uh, change it to true first so we see that the tests actually work? Thank you. We, we call a function that we start just calling sol. We will probably have a better later and give it the input. And that should be equals equals to the output. Now we need to create the sol uh, function. And you can create it here. And uh, I want to just return the output and see if the test passes. Oh, we never saw them fail. Let's just return an empty string then first. I'm Emily. I'm next. All of is navigating and someone is typing. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, okay, try to run this. Thank you. Great. So now please change it output. And uh, hopefully we can get to green state. Let's check it. Uh, yes, we did. So I want to do some refactoring now. Uh, I think uh, to start with, I don't want to, to, to call the uh, variable row eight inputs because that over, overshadows like the in-visiting function of input in Python. So let's call it ex uh, uh, integration inputs or something. So ensemble, do you have a better name? Sample input, I would call it. Yeah, great. That's better. Thank you, Emily. Oh, it didn't rename it. Oh, and the argument to the method. 
No, that's uh, that's fine because it's a parameter to the function, I believe. So so uh, we could uh, probably improve that too. Uh, call it uh, uh, problem, maybe solve problem. So change it to problem. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's go down. Uh, I, I I kind of I'm kind of uh, annoyed by this. There's so much white space here. Can we are you are we okay with shrinking the removing all the new lines? Uh, ensemble. Is that fine for, with you? I think we can see it better then. In the input and output. Yeah. Uh, it rotates. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Olaf is typist, Emily is navigator. I'm starting the clock now. So let's change this to um, instead of using assert, can we write um, verify solve sample input instead? Yeah, and then um, like this or what? yeah, like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and then you have to import the the verify function from approval tests. Import yes, there we are. Approval test verify. Cool. Right. Let's try. Oh, test something isn't a good name. Before we run this, let's rename that to test sample. And I'll leave you with that cliffhanger there of what happens next. Um, but I, hopefully that was enough time for you to get some idea of what the ensemble roles are like and how it works with a rotation. Um, hopefully you've observed that the typist is the person entering the code into the computer, but the navigator is the person deciding what code should be written. And actually being able to express yourself verbally about coding is a skill. And it's not a skill that many people actually have even if they've got like loads of experience writing code, it's it takes a little while to get good at this. Um, it also takes a while to get good at being a, a team member here, supporting your navigator and knowing when to speak and when to stay silent. So actually being able to do this effectively is, is a skill that uh, you can practice and get better at. And it really, in my experience, helps your teamwork and collaboration. And for this to be possible, I, I can't say uh, any much more about ensemble working. You have to have a basic level of respect and consideration and kindness towards one another. And it actually does help when you're starting out with ensemble working if you nominate someone, the facilitator, and have that person not take part in the normal rotations and just pay attention to keeping a, a good psychologically safe environment for everyone who's present. So as a technical coach, I, the first thing I do with a, a team who hasn't worked this way before is my main role is this facilitator, just to try and get everyone to, to work nicely together. And uh, once we've um, got the basic way of working, then I can start to inject new ideas and ways of working helping them to get down that ski slope using the new technique. So at this point, I just wanted to go back to another uh, Mentimeter question. Um, I've got a question here about technical leadership. Because as a technical coach, I'm a, a technical leader. And I was wanting to make a new word cloud here about how, how would you describe the behavior of a, a great technical leader? Oh, right, you've got lots of ideas about this. Yeah, and uh, so coming up here, lots of people must have written supportive, patient, open, listening, approachable, empathy. Yeah, you need a huge amount of people skills for this. Um, so this is really, really good. Um, I like this. And has anyone written anything that's kind of more technical? Knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah, you have to be knowledgeable. Um, calm. Pedagogy. Pedagogy. Psychology. Yeah, yeah. No stuff. Yes. So there's lots of, of, of characteristics of a technical leader. So when I'm joining the ensemble, I'm trying to be that supportive, um, open, listening, approachable 
kind of uh, person. And I'm trying to, um, to do that and also coach them to use better technical practices. So this um, is a coaching model I wanted to show you uh, that comes from the Agile Coaching Institute. And this predates um, all of the, the work I've done with the Saman method. It's, it's been around for years and it's much more general. This is about Agile coaching in general. And it's a kind of a model of what, it, what it's about. And at the top here in the middle, it says Agile Lean Practitioner. And that means that to be a good coach, first and foremost, you actually need to have done the thing you're coaching. Um, you didn't just start out someday as, as a coach. You actually have been a practitioner of the thing you're coaching. Then at the bottom, we've got three um, areas of mastery. And most coaches will specialise in one of those. Um, so transformation mastery is about helping an organisation to do an agile transformation, uh, introduce new processes, ways of working, organisation. Business mastery is about um, helping an organisation with the product side of thing, um, what to build, what, how to prioritise it, how to communicate uh, through the organisation what we're building and why. And then technical mastery has always been there um, as a, an area that needs coaching. And that's the area, of course, I specialise in, um, TDD and CI, CI, CD and all of that stuff. And then the things on the sides here, the four um, other, the ones in blue and red, those are the behaviours that a coach needs to exhibit in order to do their job. And we've talked already about teaching, that's the learning hours largely, although teaching does come up in the ensemble as well. And facilitating, that's a huge part of what you're doing in the ensemble. Um, and in the learning hours, actually. Uh, but then there's these two other areas I wanted to say a little more about so that you could see that it's actually really important for a technical coach to do these things too. So I've got a slide here about mentoring and I've put up a whiteboard sketch that means nothing to you, I'm sure. Uh, it's a, a photograph of a whiteboard um, sketch that we made with a team I was coaching and it's um, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a scenario. It's a scenario for the feature they were building, something to do with time quotas. And it may not be very obvious, but this is a, actually a concrete scenario for when the time quota should um, <clears throat> be fulfilled, when the DTP thing is enabled. After four seconds and two seconds, it should do something. So uh, I was mentoring this team in completing this feature using double loop TDD. So I facilitated the whiteboard discussion to come up with this example. And then I was like, right, okay, now we're going to write a test case, a component test for this whole feature. And I um, helped them to write that test and, and make it readable and, and see it fail. And then I helped them say, okay, well, that's a component test. Now we need a unit test. And I said, okay, we're going to do the unit tests and we're going to write those. And after a few days of building unit tests for this uh, new feature, eventually we got the component test to pass. So I was very much directing very closely how they were going to build this new feature. And that's what I would call mentoring, where you're actually really opinionated about how they should be doing stuff. That's in a bit contrast to the other thing that I wanted to talk about, which was professional coaching. And uh, this is all about asking the right questions at the right time. Um, it's much more hands off. So again, there's another diagram here. You've got no idea what this is. Uh, it's a UML diagram of the, the system that this team was working on, a particular area of the system that the one team member who was, uh, had already identified that he wanted to refactor this. because So we drew this um, UML diagram of the code to try and work out what all the dependencies were. And we identified these five classes were all in the same module. And we wanted to split up that module because it was too big. And I didn't have to do very much at all. I just had to kind of say, um, so how do we want to split this up then? And they were like, oh yeah, these two hang together and these three hang together. It's clear from the dependencies. And I just had to kind of say, okay, so um, what's the smallest step we could take in the direction of this split that would still leave all the code compiling? And they discuss it and they come up with an approach and they start doing it. And then I, I say, at one point, I just kind of say, wait, wait, wait a minute could you think of a different way to do this that wouldn't break the tests? And just, just asking that question and then they could, you know, then they sorted it. 
So professional coaching is is much more about they're doing it. They have the knowledge. They they know how to do it. You just have to prompt them. So that's different ways for a coach to behave. So let me. I just wanted to look back at what what we've got in our, our word cloud um, now, uh, just to see if anything else had come up. But yeah, it's all of this is the behaviour of a great technical leader, and that's the kind of leader I'm trying to be when I'm working with an ensemble. Um, adapting my behaviour to the needs of the team so that we can make progress and they can um, work better together and learn some technical practices. So that's what Saman Technical Coaching is all about. We're trying to coach teams because software is built by teams. Um, we are going to work with ensemble working two hours a day and one hour of learning hour each day. So uh, for each team, that's like half a day with the coach. And you do 10 coaching days at a time because uh, people need breaks, even coaches. And uh, those breaks are great because that means the team has to start using what they've learned for themselves. So that's, this is a more detailed description of what the Salmon Method comprises. There's a little bit more to it as well, but I'll come to that. Um, this works both with local coaches and with remote coaches. Of course, all the coaching work I did before March last year was um, was local. And since then it's all been remote. And I found that it works, it still works remotely and it, it has different pros and cons compared with being local. Um, so uh, I think it works in both modes. Um, I want to say a little more about the breaks and, and my schedule. I mean, for the team's perspective, they get they get uh, over a three week period, they get 10 day, 10 half days with the coach. From my perspective, I can kind of um, have a schedule where I'm meeting several different teams. And uh, maybe my schedule isn't always this busy, but perhaps I'll be working with four teams at, at a time and um, some in the morning, some in the afternoons. And those ones that where it says uh, just WS on a, on a little stripe. That's where I have a workshop with one of the teams that I'm not coaching yet. I, I have to get to know the teams before we launch into the coaching. Um, and I'm gonna. So that's so my schedule as a coach looks like um, a lot of time with teams, coaching, doing learning hours and ensemble working, meeting a lot of people. Um, it's really good fun and it's quite hectic. Um, team. Chartering. So I mentioned there were two workshops. Before I start coaching a team, I need to get to know them a little and they need to get to know me. So I have two, these two workshops that happen beforehand. The first workshop is really just me listening to the team, trying to work out who they are, what they're doing. We look at some code samples. Um, we talk about their unit tests and, you know, stuff. And then I come back at the second workshop with some ideas for what we're going to do in the coaching and say, well, look, we could we could talk about TDD, and look, this is what TDD is. <clears throat> and uh, uh, together, collaboratively agree, collaboratively agree what the focus for the coaching will be and whether we've got some goals, make a charter. So uh, generally, the, the goals are, are the same. It's um, we want the teams and the organisations to improve the technical side of things. Agile is, is technical as well as social and organisational. Um, and we're kind of learning new skills with your team, and that should become a normal part of the way you work together. And crucially, the new behaviours should continue after the coach has left, because that's really what matters. What you're doing while the coach is there is very much secondary to what you do after they've gone. So that's in a nutshell, what the Salmon Method is. I wrote this book about it because I think the world needs more technical coaches. Um, and I wanted to just tell you a story uh, about, about this picture, which I already showed you, actually. Um, this was a couple of years ago. I, I was coaching a team and um, I was chatting with the Scrum Master. And she said, oh, yeah, just a couple of months ago, I was actually a programmer on this team. And now I'm the uh, the scrum master. <clears throat> and I, I, I said, oh, why, why didn't you come to our ensemble sessions? You could code with us. And she's like, no, no, no. No, I don't code anymore. Oh. <laughs> um, 
And I was just like, really? You don't code anymore? But that's the fun part. Um, so I said, th- th- so why did you decide to become a scrum master? And she said, well, you know, I was talking to my manager and he advised me that I could go on this course, I could get this certification, I could find all, all about it. And I, I did that. And, it, I, you know, this was really fun. I met loads of inspiring people and, and I thought this would be a great career for me. So I'm like, yeah, great. I mean, I'm sure she's made a good choice uh, and I'm sure she's happy with her. I mean, it would be very arrogant of me to say that she's made the wrong choice. Um, But it just set me thinking and I was kind of thinking about that manager and what was going through his head when he made this recommendation. He's, He's looking at his software developer team member and she's bright, she's engaged, she's ambitious, she's competent, she's socially competent and he sees in front of him, ah, she could become a scrum master. I want him to have another option in his head when he advises her and and she to see another option. You could become a technical coach. You do not have to stop coding. You can use all that amazing ambition and competence and social skills that you have and apply that to technical coaching. And at the moment, the way it looks is there's a bunch of scrum masters and they've got this party going on and it looks so, so much fun. And technical coaches, it's just like me and a couple of my colleagues. And we're having great fun. But, you know, there's there's not this whole community and stuff going on and, and help. And that was really my motivation for writing this book, to put a stake in the ground and say, look, this is what technical coaching could be like. This is how you could do it. This is a possible career for you. So I'm just going to then put this question to you on Mentimeter. Do you think that this might be something for you? Do you agree with me? Do you see that there might be a need for technical coaching? Perhaps you're already doing some technical coaching. That's the second option. And and perhaps you're interested to look more closely at the Salmon method. This is kind of encouraging. Yeah, so this is very encouraging. People see, you do see a need for technical coaching. A lot of people, it's kind of getting seven out of 10 uh, people agreeing with me. And um, not many people are doing technical coaching. We're getting like two out of 10. And perhaps half of you are think that, oh, maybe I should look more closely at the Salmon Method. Well, that's cool. If you'd like to find out more, um, there's actually a link in the, the chat now to a little form. If you, if you want to get in touch with me and, and, you know, be part of creating this community of technical coaches, um, maybe at the moment it's just ideas that I have really and this book. Um, but do sign up on my, my form that's in the chat. Uh, Pro Agile has a form for that. And, um, oh, no, no, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this. So this is my, my last slide now about Salmon Technical Coaching. We, we talked at the very start about the Accelerate book and research, and it really backs up my experience that technical practices matter. It's all about feedback loops and the innermost feedback loop is test-driven development. And a lot of people, as we've seen in this survey, in this group, a lot of people haven't learned it and there aren't many effective ways to learn it. That's what's basically led me to come up with the the Saman method, which consists basically of the learning hour and the ensemble working. And uh, that is what I'd like you to remember from this talk, if anything. So uh, thank you so much. I've got some Q&A now. Um, Let me just rearrange my windows so that I can look at the Q&A and see if I can answer your questions. Okay, so in the Q&A, you can also vote if, you, if the, your interesting question isn't at the top, you can vote or you can ask another question. 
so the one that's got the most votes at the moment is this one from Peter. Uh, what do you do? What to do about those fake agile coaches and tools? The ones that lack technical skill and don't care about technology. Oh, <laughs> that, that's. I think you're you're reacting to um, perhaps some over enthusiastic coaches that you've met. Um, the thing is, I think there is there is a place for non technical coaches or less technical coaches. I think that there is stuff you need to change in your organisation and the way you work together that you don't need to be able to code in order to be doing something useful and saying something useful about. So I think there is a place for, for those coaches, but I don't see enough of the technical ones who actually do get involved. So why? Oh, oh yeah, so I'm, that's moved to answered. Okay, so the next one that's coming up here is, are there any best practices or guidelines to deal with complete disagreements during ensemble programming? Yeah. Um, so, so that was my thing about having a facilitator, somebody who thinks it's their responsibility to try and diffuse that kind of situation. Um, encourage the, the group to have a timeout if it's really bad um, and come back when they've calmed down. Um, but if, if um, the disagreement is not so serious that you need to pause the whole ensemble and you just need to do something, a good coaching technique is to say, OK, well, we've got maybe two ideas about how to solve this problem. Uh, we can't agree, but we have Git and we know how to uh, create a branch. So we'll just create a branch and we'll work on this idea for a time box of 10 minutes or 15 minutes or however long you think it takes. And after that time box, we will leave that branch and go to revert, go to another branch and try out the other idea. And again, same time box. And then after that experience, hopefully, the team will be able to come to some agreement about what was the best approach. So that's uh, that's one tip for that situation. Okay, another question here. How do you handle a team member who won't engage in ensemble programming who just observes? So that's not necessarily a problem uh, if they actually can be encouraged to speak up at the moment when they have the crucial piece of knowledge that the team needs. Um, so the, the initial thing we do is we have this equal rotation that everyone should spend equal time in each role. And that's to set it up so that it's normal that everyone takes part and everyone learns to do the roles. Some people don't feel psychologically safe enough to just start doing that and they want to observe for a while. And that's okay while they're learning. And the coach should encourage them to speak up if, if you know that we're discussing something that they're an expert in. And then hopefully you can draw them in gradually <laughs> to actually start taking a, a bigger part. But yeah, it's it's um, if they're not engaging because they're actually anti and and don't care and don't want to be there, then then that's another problem. Maybe you you allow them to not not be in the team um, to choose to do something else, and the rest of the people get on with it. So yeah, it, it depends, but there were some ideas. Um, okay, so I'm going to put done on that, and I'm going to put done on that. Oh yeah, and I think I put done on that, okay. Okay, so the next question I've got here is, in your opinion, which test comes first, the system test, the integration test, or the unit test? In my opinion, oh, of course it depends. Um, so if you're doing double loop TDD, then the, the classic thing is to start from the user perspective and try and understand what the user is trying to achieve with your software and try and write a, a test that describes that and that when that passes, the user would be happier. And that could be a system test, it could be an integration test, or it could be a unit test, actually, if you've got a really good architecture. Um, but the important part about the guiding test is it's from the user's perspective. And then, but often that's too big to make it pass in one step, so you drop down to a shorter feedback loop with, with unit tests. Great, I think that's... Uh, read up more on BDD. Seb Rose and uh, Gaspar Nagy have written a great book on BDD. Read up on that. Um, does ensemble programming work for introverts? Well, I mean, um, I'm not that much of an introvert myself, but, but I, what I've heard is that um, 
it's it's quite structured. The collaboration that you have in an ensemble is quite structured. You have a role. You Once you've learned the technique, you know when you're supposed to speak and you know when you're supposed to stay silent and you know what kinds of things you're supposed to say at any one moment. So for somebody who doesn't like speaking in front of people who are in a group, it's actually much safer than many other forms of interaction. And um, in my experience, I've, I've had people in the ensemble who were who were uncomfortable and um but when you reassure them and the facilitator is there kind of encouraging them and, and coaching them a little to say the right things at the right time um usually people can uh, uh can get on with it and and even after a while describe themselves as enjoying it so i think it can work and it it's rests to some extent on the facilitation um, okay, we've still got a few more minutes. Um, do you have concerns about issues of problem scalability, particularly after the coach has finished the coaching, i.e. ramping up to longer term practice? Oh, so as I said, I'm always, my primary concern is how is this team going to behave differently when I've left? How, how can they take what they're do, we're doing now and, and, and actually use it? to do something useful long-term. Um, the most important thing is that they, they're going to they're gonna get something. So yeah, that's my total concern. <laughs> um, and if, if I'm seeing what I'm doing is not having an impact, when I come back to that team after I've, you know, I have my 10-day coaching block, I've gone away, I've come back for another 10-day coaching block, I pick them up and realise, oh, um, nothing's happened. Then I've got to, I've got to do better. I've got to raise my game. And maybe I need to do something differently. Um, but my experience is that, that after two coaching blocks, maybe three, think, things should start to change. Uh, that's, I hope I answered that question in the way you were expecting. Yeah. So, um, the next most voted question, I've got two minutes left, is, um, uh, will the coach other teams or support the current team technically. So one style of technical coaching is that you have an embedded technical coach with one team full time. The Salmon method is different. You have a coach who's supporting uh, and coaching several teams um, in the same organisation or, or even in different ones. Um, so it's a different way of working and I would expect a Salmon coach to be engaged with more than one team. Um, and this is, question is similar. Do I think that uh, teams should have full-time technical coaches and leads? I think you, if you're um, getting good results from that, absolutely do, do that. Um, carry on with that. Uh, but in my experience, a lot of organisations um, would benefit from having uh, skill coaches, perhaps influencing more teams, uh, and ha perhaps that would have a bigger impact. Um, so that's, that's kind of a thing you'd have to find out for your organisation, I guess, what works best for you and your team. And how do you convince sceptical teammates to try pair programming, let alone ensemble working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a funny thing, but sometimes there's less resistance to ensemble working than there is to pair programming. Um, so perhaps try that. Some, there's something about the whole team getting together and... and um, making events with a um, can be more attractive for people. Um, so try that. Uh, but if they're really skeptical, you know, frame it as an experiment, classic coach approach. Say, we'll try this for this many days or hours and then we'll evaluate. And if you don't like it, then we'll never do it again, you know. And then make it safe to try. Okay, Emily. I think we are at the end of the session um but i see uh, that there are many questions perhaps you can name a room in remo where you are open uh, to answer this question or discuss this with uh, the attendees and uh so there's some time in the break <clears throat> to do this and uh, thank you very much for this uh great brilliant keynote and Thank you. Thank you very much Thank you. for inviting me.